Thanks, guys. I, just want to, uh, I will post this in a memo on the course website. Um, just some questions that came up from the different group meetings of the mission as well. One is that uh, the sensitivity analysis is required in your economic section, so I'll, I'll emphasize that in the memo. Uh, troubleshooting, if you do the troubleshooting section, yes, it does come towards the page limit. And then lastly, um, part of your project, there will be a separate page that you hand in, just a single sheet that shows the contribution of everyone to the project. So you write person one did such and such section, and maybe there's two or three people that work on that section, but that's okay. So uh, there's a group allocation description in the project. So I'll, I'll put that up on the website in a memo later this week or early next week. And I'll also put there the details on the page length so we can limit and so we love to a lot of detail on that plan for people to come So this operability topic I going we're still considering um, there's actually eight subsections potentially we could, we could look at regarding operability. We're only going to be looking at the operating window of the process, understand what that's about, and then uh, we'll talk a bit about flexibility and controllability and reliability coming out of it. And I hope to touch also on the one aspect here on the operating for transitions to starting up and shutting down processes. That's really the extent of the time we have available for covering this topic. Then we'll look at uh, troubleshooting in, the, in next week's class, and there will be a final tutorial on that topic. So there's no tutorial on Monday coming up, but the following Monday, uh, the week of the first SDL presentations, there will be a tutorial on that Monday on troubleshooting. So let's take a look at uh, where we were last time. We, we were essentially investigating different um, different systems through example of understanding where the process operates at steady state. So given given the operating equations for those processes that we're considering, we can constrain ourselves and find bounds for different combinations of variables. And we looked at, two, at several examples last time. We ended off with this example where we're asking for this pump, we've got several variables that could be at good or bad combinations of each other and will affect the pressure generated from that pump and by extension that whole flow system. And so some of the variables we identified were the level in this tank, the friction in the piping and the length of the piping, pressure drops across those heat exchanges, and then the back pressure in this reaction vessel will essentially cause a back pressure up against us. So this pump needs to work under all conditions. And the worst combination of those conditions are quite easy to identify, simply when that tank level is at its lowest, so we've got little pressure coming into this pump, but then this pump needs to generate a pressure P so that it can handle all the friction and pressure drops across that, that entire valve, the heat exchanges, and the length of that pipe pixel. And then also counteract the back pressure that might have accumulated in the vessel. So all of those give us an idea of the operating window of the process. We could design this pump so that it operates under very high tank level and low tank level. High pressure drops and low pressure drops through this piping, and high pressure and low pressure in that in that vessel. But it's clear that if we design it for the worst case, it's going to work for for the other combinations as well. So that's that's usually the approach we follow when we determine the operating window is to identify firstly the variables that that are can change over over the process. And that goes to the class about two three back where we looked at different ways the process. Um, experiences disturbances, so either manual changes or unintended changes that occur in the process, or our lack of knowledge of the fundamentals of the operating model. So, for example, we don't always know theoretically the parameters that are in these models, so we've got low and high values for those parameters. Values. So all of those are changes that could occur. That's the first step to identify which variables could change, and secondly, identify the lower and upper bounds for them, and then do simulations for, for those combinations. Now, it can, the number of simulations to do can quickly uh, get unmanageable. So it's a factorial type combination of, over there. So we tend to just pick the worst combination or combinations and make sure that the process can operate at steady state 
for those combinations. So this is the key part here, is operate as steady state for those combinations. The next class that we're going to look at the flexibility and control words is going to look at dynamic operation. So when we're transitioning from one steady state to, to the other, or we've got control systems operating and they're moving our process around, we, can, we need to make sure we can handle those transitions as well. But for now, the operating window only considers steady state. So essentially, um, we might think then, well, why not always design for that worst case? and just put on a very large pump. So that, that could be the temptation to do that. And I'm not going to go through this as an exercise, but I think the answers written up here are fairly obvious. If we did go and design always for small equipment, we would obviously have lower capital costs. Um, we would have fairly good efficiency at, at, the, at the base case design. That's true for, for small equipment. We can generally get them operating more efficiently than large equipment. Um, and we can often achieve very precise, very small changes to those smaller, smaller pieces of equipment. So this is on the order of laboratory scale, pilot plant scale equipment. Obviously, we can't achieve the capacity we need with that small equipment. And we may not be able to dynamically reject disturbances. So, we're, we're already starting to see some of the topics coming from the, from the next class in here. These small pieces of equipment need to not only operate at steady state, but also be able to operate in real time and be able to reject the disturbances, to compensate for those disturbances. Um, and a small piece of equipment may not be able to compensate for a really large disturbance. So if a large change in temperature or a large set point change that's called for by an operator, a small piece of equipment may not be able to implement that required change. And also, it may not be able to get it done fast enough. So we may end up moving into a region of unsafe operation or undesirable economic operation. If we can't get a transition from one point to another done really quickly, that delay is we're producing off-spec product or we're potentially moving into unsafe operating points during that time. So that's small equipment. And then large equipment would be mostly the converse of those. Um, I will post these notes online with the answers filled in. So if you're not getting everything down, don't feel uh, too rushed. Rather, rather pay attention to the class than actually write everything down. Now, so again, large equipment, we can get higher capacity, we can get a, uh, compensate for a greater range of services that we can make and faster transitions, but it comes at the cost of the capital itself and reduced efficiency. These larger pieces of equipment generally can't operate as efficient as smaller ones. So those, those solutions written up there are pretty straightforward. What we're going to look at next is, um, well, okay, so I guess to summarize it, then if, we, if you're saying Small has its advantages and, and large has its advantages. There is a, 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 a good point. And we see this over and over in chem There's optimal pipe sizes, optimal pump sizes, optimal reactor sizes. There's always a trade-off between economics and operating costs as well. So it's no surprise in that there is a sweet point where this works just well. can be designed for that for most of the operation. But we have to recognize that if we design for this sweet spot, okay, we now may have a, a pump or piping design that's undersized in some situations and, and oversized in other situations, if we design for the midpoint here. So we're now still back in the same position. I, I still want to be able to operate my plant in a flexible, reliable manner, but I want to achieve disturbing, I want to be able to manipulate my processes to counteract disturbances in, in a reliable and fast manner. But if I've got a pump that's kind of designed for that midpoint, I might not be able to achieve it. So what we're going to look at next then are different setups through a series of case studies that allow us to design for the midpoint, but operate periodically when we need to in a more flexible manner. Okay, so this is Essentially what we're adding here is complexity to the flow sheet, but it's, this complexity is being added for a reason. It's added for those 
occasions when we need to call for more flow than we normally would have to, or more pressure, um, or greater heat transfer capability, or faster response than we would otherwise have. Okay, so we recognize that our base design will operate well most of the time, but there are periods of time where we need more or less, or faster or slower than otherwise. So the next uh, few, few slides here are on topics that, when you look back at this after the class today, will seem obvious, but we haven't always addressed this in our fluid flow courses and heat transfer courses um, adequately, in my mind. I, I see this in undergraduate uh, curriculums, when I did undergraduate, you learn the basics of fluid flow and piping design and pump sizing and so on. But we never actually get to put it all together in a way to think, well, how can we make it work better or faster um, or make it more capable? So we're going to look at a few case studies. Here's two. I'd like you to uh, think for a, a minute there. Uh, we've put two pumps in series or two pumps in parallel. And we're fami are you familiar with pump curves? from your fluid flow course. Let's, quick, let's just have a quick recap. Um, as as we, we had in the class the previous day, these pump curves show the point where a pump will operate. You can operate anywhere along this line. And that line, my point along this x-axis where I move is dependent on the flow rate. So I have my pump operating. There's a valve downstream from the pump. And as I throttle that valve open or closed, I'm regulating the amount of flow through that pump. The pump turns. This is a centrifugal pump at constant speed. So the pump is not being adjusted. You certainly can purchase variable speed pumps. They're more costly. But for the most part, pumps we purchase operate at constant rotational speed, constant RPMs. So when I move, I adjust my flow rate, I'm throttling my valve position on the, on the pipe downstream of the pump. As I do that, and I decrease my flow rate, I'm able to generate a higher pressure on the outlet of that pump. So lower flow coming out of the pump, but I can obtain a higher pressure, a higher head. Conversely, if I open that valve, and let's say that valve can open from zero flow all the way to say 100%, which is past the edge of this curve here, there's a point at which I can open that valve, but that pump is just going to not be able to deliver the required pressure. There's too much flow, I'm not able to convert the kinetic energy that's going from the pump to the fluid to generate a pressure. So all that a pump is is really exchanging kinetic energy from the rotation of the veins of the pump over to pressure potential energy. So given that background, what would happen would you assume if I place two pumps in series? What would happen to the head? What would happen to the flow? <coughs> Let's consider the series case. What's, what's essentially happening by placing two pumps in series? So here's my first pump on that pump curve. The net flow that that pump is able, that those two pumps together are able to deliver is the same as the single pump, but the pressure head is higher. So I can use this concept to generate higher pressure when I need it. So if I don't need higher pressure, what I can simply do is run a pipe around here into that. So put a bypass around that second pump, pump number two off, and just run flow around the second pump if I just need my regular pressure. When I'm calling for higher pressure requirements, I can then close the bypass and then turn on pump two and go through my second pump and get the same flow but at higher pressure. The parallel configuration, what would that look like as an overall pump curve? This is overall in series. Oh, 
Oh, roll in parallel? Yeah. You can push more flow into them because uh, you have two pumps uh, being with each, so I think you're going to have to extend them. Extend this out of it. So it's pretty much the same head, but you can now get greater flow. So this is overall in parallel. Okay, so I'm able to call for greater flow when I need it by turning on that second pump. Both also actually provide me extra reliability in my process. These two configurations give me greater operating window. I've extended my operating window to have higher pressure or higher flow. So that's great. I'm able to achieve greater operating window. But it's also actually given me some greater reliability in my process. We might, hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit about reliability. But essentially, Rabat says, if one pump had to break down, I've always got the other one to fall back on. So either configuration would extend or increase the reliability of that overall system. They could always fall back on the alternative part if one had to break. Okay, so, so we've covered this thing, the higher pressure and approximately the same flow rate for the first configuration and the parallel configuration gets higher flow but at the same head. Take, let's take consider another case. This, this often happens during startup of a process. So again, we're, 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 mixed, we're covering a lot of operability topics here. This topic, uh, this flow example that we're talking about now, would also be meaningful in the discussion when we transition it or when we're starting up and shutting down the process. When we start out the process here, a flash drums. We've got our feed coming in. We're heating it with, with another process stream. We're heating it with a second steam uh, heat exchanger. The vapor flow is, is usually small, but in some cases we can get 20 times the value of the regular flow leaving at the top there in P1. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, this top valve over here. So by this measuring that flow, it can be 20 times greater than this, the base case steady state. What can I do in terms of my piping and instrumentation to achieve a, a larger operating window so I can actually handle that, that period? I still want to regulate that, that flow, but I have to accept that that pipe sometimes needs to allow a flow that's 20 times what I'm normally expecting. and see this, we, we have parallel networks in our, in our piping. So provide an additional valve over there. And that pipe is actually sized to be substantially larger than the, than the, than the other pipe. So add this additional large pipe that will contain most of the flow. And then what we'll do is we'll instrument our pressure control, because we still want to control the overall pressure leaving there, is we'll have pressure control on that smaller valve. So it's kind of like a fine tuning pressure control, and then if, if that's insufficient to achieve the pressure that we're looking for, we can adjust the other larger valve. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a two-stage two type pressure control. You manipulate your smaller valve first, if that can't achieve your desired flow, uh, sorry, pressure that you're looking for, manipulate the other one. So parallel networking in, in p is, is fairly common if you, if you look at them closely. So those are, those are some ways uh, we can extend our operating window. So as, as shown here, once we've, once we've done all of those, there's very few exceptions to this. It's not common that we find regions that are, are not operable. In general, it's a, it's a continuous uh, region. OK, now we're looking at a few more details that bring into your fluid flow courses and other engineering topics into play here. Let's take a look at this design. For steady state, we're pumping fluid from a tank through a heat exchanger, a valve that's being manipulated and is being manipulated to achieve a certain flow, and that flow is measured in an orifice type meter. So if we consider the elements here, we've got a pump that's uh, 
increasing the velocity of the fluid here, providing us a greater pressure on the outlet, so a high pressure fluid over here than over here. This pressure, go, uh, that fluid passes through the heat exchanger, there's a valve that's manipulating the flow, and we ultimately want to control that flow to some stable value. Anything that might concern you with that, that fluid's at 20 degrees, <coughs> anything that might, might jump out at you. This is not, not an easy one um, to, to see. It. it actually looks like a fairly good design. We've got flow control, we've got a valve there. But um, there's a, the, the, the issue comes down to how we measure that flow. What are some of the ways we can measure flow that you're aware of? That you might have seen in co-op terms or learned about in your courses? The magnetic flow meter. And what's the principle being used there? The magnetic ions in the water and the magnetic field. Sorry, the magnetic field. That's one. Any other principles that flow? I mean, here we've got this orifice plate, so that's not another obvious one. Measuring fluid, you want to measure the fluid flow in a pipe, not the velocity, the flow rate, meters cubed per hour, kilograms per hour. You use um, pressure over, say, like a venturi, so. Pressure over the venturi, yeah. Turbine is directly proportional to the flow. So and there's a few others that are, are listed on a website that I'll link to on the course website that you can go read about. But here the issue in this particular flow sheet comes down to the orifice meter. So let's just take a quick recap on that. Uh, we've got our orifice meter there. This is this constriction in the in the pipe, forcing the fluid to come down to a smaller diameter. As we do that, the pressure will change in the fluid part. So initially we've some pressure here at point one, upstream of the orifice meter at the orifice and just past it, we drop down to a lower pressure. That's from Bernoulli's law, we accelerate the fluid, it's got a higher velocity at point number three over there, and so there's a subsequent pressure drop. At point two, we, we recover that pressure as our flow uh, velocity uh, slows down again, but we don't recover everything. So there is a permanent pressure loss across that. So the delta P then across the orifice is measuring, uh, that's very straightforward to measure, and we can relate that to the flow in the pipe. So let's, we can measure that, and here we see what the principle looks like. Uh, so here's my flow at a certain pressure relative to some baseline. So an arbitrary baseline pressure by measuring that corresponding pressure up there through this differential device. So this is just prior to the orifice and then the other side of the tube there is just after the orifice. As I, if I, had, if I could build a device, and, and we can do it, move this piping around left and right, left and right, I can essentially measure that pressure profile. So here my pressure profile be a sudden drop of pressure and then recover it after the orifice. Now, in principle, we will not measure the pressure difference based on that, but we can digitize that with reliable sensors. So that delta P is easily measurable. Flow is not easily measurable, but the delta P, very easy to measure reliably. 
<coughs> so uh, a quick recap then of Bernoulli's equation uh, from the momentum balance <coughs> around that orifice. We've got the pressure, capital P1, related to the density of the fluid in G, the velocity of the fluid C1, and then the pressure at point three, velocity at point three, and then some friction losses. So ignoring the friction losses, we can rearrange that equation for V1. Uh, so rearrange this equation for V1 and it will be a function of P3 minus P1 as well as the velocity at point three. Then um, this general equation over here simply is a mass balance. Uh, that should actually be a lowercase v1. So it's essentially saying the flow at point one is the cross-sectional area times the velocity at one is the same as the cross-sectional area at three times v3. So if we do that, um, that mass balance and we substitute v1 in from Bernoulli's equation into there, we get the general, what's called the general v equation. So it's a function of the pressure drops as well as the orifice diameters or area, cross-sectional areas, A1 and A3. Or if I lump all those constants together, I can create a single equation uh, that's only a function of the pressure drop and the fluid density. So rho zero fluid density, which will not really change appreciably at all across the orifice there. The, the main thing is if we simply ignore that density um, or we assume density is constant, or we calibrate for density, in other words, I can create this equation that will give me flow as a lumped constant. So all those, those factors of the, of the orifice uh, geometry and then the pressure drop. So K and the delta P. So delta P I measure, K I can calculate based on my orifice's geometry and fluid properties. So when we install an orifice meter, there, um, we essentially are measuring the delta P with an electronic device across two points in the pipe. That's, we take the square root of that in computer software or in hardware, and then on the circuit board, and then we uh, multiply by K, and then that measured value is then sent to the flow controller. So that's the principle of these flow meters. They're not too expensive, but they're not cheap either because they've got all this, this uh, measurement of the delta P and the electronic circuitry in there to essentially output a flow value to you. And then that's what's sent back to the valve through a flow controller to manipulate the valve position. But one other thing just to be aware of then is also that that valve, that constant, sorry, up there in front, that table is a function of the Reynolds number, and we typically assume that's constant as well. We're operating at, so at, a, at a high enough velocity that our Reynolds number is not going to affect that constant. Okay. So again, that impacts the accuracy of the, of the flow meter at really low flows. We would, we would accept, expect a higher error at low flow. Okay, but then coming back to this issue now, and we're tying this up to that flow sheet we had earlier, the key disadvantage, obviously, of the RFS meter is pressure loss or head loss. So whatever energy we put in with our pump, we're going to lose some of it um, through that RFS meter. The other disadvantage is also um, if we're dealing with any sort of slurry type material, we could get plugging of that pipe. So any um, slurry or, or fibrous type material Anything along those lines is not going to work very well in this, in this particular type of flow meter. So there's alternatives, and one particular that does work well for slurries is the venturi that Sean mentioned. That um, looks something along the lines of, of this, and then we come down at a smooth angle to a narrow constriction in the pipe, and then we take it back up. up here. Back out against the same. So it's a, still the same idea. We measure the pressure <coughs> at P1 and P3, but we have uh, less possibility of cl cl clogging that pipe. But also, it's a, a more expensive uh, flow element. Okay, so let's come back to that now. Now, given that knowledge of the of the pressure loss. 
one of the issues that can happen is that we can get fluid vaporizing just past that orifice flow. And so just at that very low pressure point where we've accelerated the fluid to a high velocity, we get a reduction in pressure that fluid can start to bubble um, and vaporize. So that, that can, that's an issue. Um, and with that vapor present in the, in the pipe then, we can't really reliably estimate the pressure difference, which then leads to an unreliable flow estimate. Okay, so the, the problem with this selecting this type of valve is it should not be selected in a fluid and for use in a fluid which is close to uh, its vapor pressure, which falls off. So the, the general principle, and this is probably the key point that you should get from this, uh, this case study here, is that where you locate your flow measurement is done based on two requirements. You locate your flow measurement where pressure is the highest and temperature is the lowest. So in this particular case, that would be just prior to the heat exchanger, but after the pump would be a more reliable location to measure your flow. Now that's a general guideline that's easy to remember um, and, and will satisfy a number of important operability issues here. We will prevent this uh, poor measurement of flow and inaccurate measurement of flow. And furthermore, that, that flashing of the fluid can, uh, can cause uh, erosion of the pipes after a long time, in the same way that it would cause that in a pump with cavitation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so, so that's, that's an important uh, and easy fix that can be done to ensure that you get good operability in the process. Here's a similar related issue. We have the distillation column here, the bottom of the distillation column. So this uh, is in the assignment as well from last week. We were talking a bit about this in class. My liquid down cover over here takes that and we send, send, send some of that liquid to the reboiler and that's vaporized and we turn it back into the column. Some of the liquid is also accumulated at the bottom and then pumped out as, as my final bottom's product. And that pumping is done through a centrifugal pump and it will send that bottom's product off to storage or to um, the second downstream distillation. <coughs> what is the condition of the fluid of that liquid accumulating in the bottom of the the distillation column there. How would you describe it? Okay, it's, it's, it's least, one of the least volatiles. Uh, anything else about it? Like what is its state? That thermodynamic state? It's close to boiling. This, this liquid is, is very close to its bubble point. It's um, also going to have issues then with that pump, as we just as we just saw earlier there with the uh, with the orifice. The same idea here with the pump. What happens as that fluid enters the pump? Or what happens if that pressure of that this liquid gets reduced? Well, how, and how might that happen? Just prior to that pump, this liquid is coming in and it's well, close to its bubble point, entering the pump. Bear in mind that what will happen is we've got portion of piping just prior to that, so there's friction along that. There may be some valves as well. There might be a flow measurement, as we saw earlier. Um, and then also, there is a tremendous pressure drop as that fluid just enters the eye of the centrifugal pump. Okay, that's exactly Bernoulli's law, again, just being applied. We're taking a fluid that's moving slowly here. We're going to put it into the eye of that pump. And, and, and speed it up with the veins. So let's take a look at that. Um, here's, a, here's a nice drawing of it. So we've got, here's my suction side of the pump. There's these rotating veins inside that accelerate and increase the velocity of the fluid. So 
So those veins then are encased in these uh, two side walls. Yeah? So there's, if I took those two side walls away, then they're encased in two side walls shown in red. But in, interior to that, there's these arc blades. Okay, so those are rotating, and they can either be in, in, inside enclosing plates or not. Uh, so it's either, either option can exist. So those rotate, they accelerate the, the fluid, that increased velocity in the fluid will decrease the pressure dramatically. So the, the pressure profile as you pass through the pump shows a, your inlet pressure on the suction side and then a tremendous drop in pressure that can cause flashing. Okay, so just to um, just a quick, I don't think it should be necessary. Um, I've seen enough of this in the chemi chem inch, but let's just make sure we we all understand what we're referring to here by flashing. Is if I drew the diagram for, for most fluids where I had the temperature on this axis and the pressure on this axis. For most of the fluids, if you look at its at its thermodynamic plots, it will show its state looking where the liquid phase was again and vapor phase was again. So we, we do this every day. If you take your, your liquid at some nominal temperature and I put it in a kettle and I turn on the kettle, I'm increasing the temperature and I can boil the fluid at constant pressure. So atmospheric pressure, I'm heating my fluid and I'll obtain a vapor phase of it as I turn my kettle on and then go for a few minutes. But there is an alternative way I can boil that fluid. I can take it at constant temperature and if I lower the pressure, I can also boil it. So I'm not changing the temperature of the fluid here, but I'm decreasing the pressure on it and around it, and I can boil that fluid. So that's, that's well known. If you take a vacuum over a fluid, it, it can start, it will start to boil. Here we're taking essentially a vacuum over the fluid for a very small area, for a very small duration, in the veins of the pump, and creating a boiling fluid in, in the pump. And so that can be catastrophic and lead to de damage of the pump. Okay, so we call that cavitation. So the liquid will partially vaporize as its pressure uh, drop occurs, and that vapor then suddenly condenses. So we get this it's called cavitation. So people will describe this as the sound of a concrete mixer. Um, I, has anyone heard cavitation in the pump when you come up uh, so I've, I don't know if this will come out as clearly as I hope it does, but um, I'll just play you a sound file. So it's supposed to sound like a concrete mixer. Not very helpful. I, I actually wish the audio file had like non-cavitation with cavitation following, so you could hear the difference. But if you listen to it closely and you look at the signal of it, you're seeing sharp spikes. And in fact, there is um, some companies will put uh, accelerometers and audio measurements close to important devices, not necessarily pumps, but devices that can experience cavitation, and they will record the sound of the fluid flowing through the pipe and then monitor that very carefully to prevent oh, to monitor incipient cavitation so that they can uh, slow slow it down or alter the flow in them to avoid it. Because okay. on some on some pumps and sensitive equipment that can lead to catastrophic <coughs> catastrophic damage. Um, just just a little bit on here that I also just wanted to touch on here's here are those pumping curves that we saw earlier. This is an important uh, important diagram to understand so Let's just quickly talk about that again to refresh your memory. We've got these solid black curves. That's the pumping curve we looked at earlier. And that's for a given impeller diameter. If I change the impeller <coughs> diameter, I would achieve a different operating curve. So one way to, to, to uh, alter the pump, let's say you've got a pump that you have a particular impeller diameter, C, and you need it improved um, pressure 
from the outlet of the pump is to move to a different impeller diameter over there. So that's one way to change your operating window without repurchasing your pump. Um, however, there's also efficiency curves that are drawn superimposed on that. This, uh, recall those efficiency curves are the efficiency with which the electrical energy input into the pump is converted over to the kinetic and pressure energy that comes out of it. So there is an optimum point, and we in fact usually, well, we should, when we purchase our pumps, we purchase them using these diagrams from the suppliers to find a point that's pretty close to the efficiency peak of the pump. And we pick them so that our nominal flow rate that we expect to operate at coincides with that. So my pressure and then my flow corresponds pretty closely to that optimum. That's how these how you would select a pump in practice. Noting also that this uh, diagram is, is for the constant speed. Okay, so that is an important important piece that, uh, of information must must be comfortable with working. Okay, so the key here then is location of our equipment is important. We saw that with orifice with the orifice plate, location of the orifice plate is important. What would you do then in this situation? if you were experiencing cavitation. What are some of the options? And even consider the case prior to the design of this process. If you know that my process is, I need to pump my fluid in some way, and I'm expecting cavitation, what can I do before I even build my plant to ensure that I don't get cavitation? What are some of the options available to me? Yeah, Patrick. Can you just cool the exit? Cool the inlet, yeah. Inlet like the pump, yeah. Inlet of the pump, yeah. yeah. But uh, how how would you cool the inlet? Heat exchanger. And what's the heat exchanger going to do? Cool it. <laughs> in addition to cooling it, I should say. Yeah, there's a risk that the heat exchanger could in induce an additional pressure drop that causes cavitation, uh, flashing the heat exchanger. But if you're aware of it, you can uh, ensure that the pressure drop is small enough, or, or you put a very high coolant in it so it cools it as soon as possible. Anything else to consider? Yeah. Uh, you can put the pump really low compared to the level of the tank. Right, so increase that delta in the height. <coughs> You just move the pump closer to the tower to reduce the friction loss. Reduce the friction loss. So all of those are valid um, options. So what we want to do is we want to increase essentially the net positive suction head required. We want to make sure that well first we make, we make sure that we, we meet the NPSH NPSHR, the net positive suction head required by the manufacturer of the pump. But we want to make sure our NPSH available is exceeds that. And we can then ensure that we achieve that higher pressure by elevating the liquid level above the pump. Um, as, as was mentioned, we can either drop the pump or, as is most commonly done, we'll see that the distillation columns are actually raised off the ground by about 45 meters. So the, the bottom tray of the distillation column is actually substantially higher off the ground to ensure that you always have that, that additional pressure. Uh, we can reduce friction losses by bringing the pumps closer or cool the liquid down. Um, but we need head for that pressure drop. So those are those are some of the options. Oh, here's a here's a plot that I was looking for earlier. Was um, the profile of the pressure through the pump as you as the fluid comes from the inlet side, where at high pressure, there's a substantial drop. Uh, well, there's somewhat of a drop through that flange, but then also as you enter the eye of the pump, there's almost this curve doesn't show it, but it's almost a more vertical drop as that fluid suddenly gets accelerated to higher velocity. The risk is that if your vapor pressure is over here and you drop the load to the lower vapor pressure, you get oil in the, in the veins of the pump, um, which is where the cavitation and that sound being created from the, from the bubble, the vapor being created and then popping as the pressure increases again on the half of the pump. Okay, so, um, yeah, but I'll post this online and you can get this down from there. But essentially, there's so many of our unit operations that operate close to boiling point that this is, a, this is an important issue, which is why we give it so much attention in this, in this part. Um, so I'll just end off with the operating window topic by saying there is no systematic way to uh, identify the operating window. We generally just do it by considering many combinations, but we mainly consider the limiting, the worst of the